the focus of this forthcoming panel is on a key topic. And I think this is a topic that has been well covered over the last day or so, looking at SMEs in particular. We live in a time right now where there are huge changes to the way that business is done. The digital revolution is, is changing businesses fundamentally. And I think one of the key issues that we, we, we would like to resolve today, keeping on board with the theme that this conference has been a leading FDI platform, is to really look at the challenges that some SMEs face when they're looking to go global. So in order to open this up, I just want to quickly introduce you to the panelists that we have for this session. We're very lucky here, and, and thank you to the organizers of AIM for, for bringing together an expert panel of, of uh, speakers. I'd firstly like to introduce the Honorable Minister Twea, who's the Minister of Industrialization, Trade, and SME Development for the Republic of Namibia. Minister Twer is a, a teacher by profession who developed and grew at rank and file in the Ministry of Education. From 2010 to 2015, he served as Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry. And in 2015, he was appointed Substantive Com Cabinet Minister as Minister of Information and Communication Technology from 2015 to 2018. The Harambee Prosperity Plan of the President intends to transform Namibia into an industrialized economy and it necessitates his recall to the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and SME Development to head the ministry since February 2018. So welcome, Minister. Next we have Mo Adid. Mo is, uh, is, from, is the Chief Operating Officer of QPAL. QPAL is a, fa a fascinating company. I had the, the joy of moderating a session at AIM Startup last year uh, where his CEO was speaking there and we were discussing a bit more about the challenges that startups face when they're going global. QPAL itself is a, is a software solutions company, uh, enables banks to rapidly expand and to, um, and to do mobile payment acceptance. So Mo's going to give us some first-hand experience in banking, SME, partnerships, data science, the digital economy, and end-to-end -end payment solutions. More recently, they've signed an exciting strategic partnership with Visa, which has enabled them to further expand their business in the MIA region. Next up, we have uh, Kamar Salim. Hello, Kamar. You're, you're joining us from uh, the global lead for SME and supply chain finance practice at the IFC World Bank. Uh, in this role, Kamar leads the IFC's efforts in building capacity of financial institutions to support SMEs across the globe while striving the, need, the needed enabling environment to, to, to facilitate that, that, that move. Kamar has over 25 years diversified experience with leading international organizations and is a renowned global expert and thought leader in SME finance. So welcome. Next, we have Raymond Yip. Raymond joins us uh, as the Deputy Executive Director of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. For those who attended the One Belt, One Road initiative this morning, you may have heard Raymond speak. Um, Mr. Yip is responsible for Hong Kong Trade Development Council's marketing and external relations, as well as the organization's network of over 50 offices worldwide. So welcome, Raymond. Abdullah, Abdullah Matawi, sorry. Welcome. Uh, Abdullah is the chairman of the Angel, uh, Dubai Angels Investors and has recently been appointed as head of commercial at Al Tamimi, the, world, the, the region's biggest law firm. He comes with a wealth of experience in corporate finance, M&A and venture capital with a deep focus on technology transactions and helping clients navigate complex shareholder and corporate governance issues. So welcome, Abdullah. So, in order to get this conversation going, I'm going to hand the, the pulpit over to His Excellency, or his, the Honourable Minister. Honourable Minister, it would be very good if you could share with us some of your thoughts in terms of this topic, specifically focusing on the opportunities, the challenges, the impediments, and the role that your country is taking to help SMEs digitalise. So I wish to hand you the, the floor, sir. Mr. Moderator, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, a very good afternoon to you all. 
Uh, because of time, let me uh, acknowledge the protocol already established uh, by the director of ceremonies. Ladies and gentlemen, SMEs, and I'll speak briefly from the Namibian point of view, uh, in terms of digitalization. Namibia first is 29 years old, very young nation. We are actually second youngest. We used to be the last, but with South Sudan, we became a little bit older now. South Sudan is the youngest. Uh, we have a population of 2.4 million. Area, 824,000 square kilometers. Very vast. And the SMEs have got the challenge that the only way for them to survive is through network, digital. Now, what have we done to help them? We have realized that with the SMEs to survive, we needed to give them the necessary tool. We have invested in the rollout of the network through all the rural areas because digital or internet, like now, if I take my phone, it is the planning tool, it is the bank, it is used in schools as a library because we don't have money to put up physical or conventional library infrastructure. Technically, network is the essential bridge, road, to connect and to enable them to advance. Digital, especially with the SMEs in Namibia, is a must. And I must share with you that in Namibia, we have already abolished the use of checks. We're not using checks. Information has been given come June 2019. Everything digital. Therefore, the use of digital for SMEs is crucial. Now, to do that, we have invested in the necessary network by consolidating all the service providers, the telecom service providers, that is, to share the network so that it is more affordable, not only for the big operators, but also for the small and medium enterprises. There is at the moment, still a huge investment opportunity in the telecommunications network. As far as the SMEs are concerned, they are operating through different zones to help them curb the high telecommunications costs for them to grow. The rural communities are serviced through digital. It is not an easy task. We are challenged with the reality, and in Namibia, we are already beyond 4G. We actually, to my knowledge, as a an immediate former ICT minister that we have last year introduced 4,5 Gs in our country. So 
we are not that very much behind. We are coping with the digital demand of the world. So do our SMEs. What I can further share with you is that our SME in Namibia, all our financial institutions have been requested. I don't want to say demanded, but we requested them. They have got SME desks to support the growth of the SMEs and they are not confined to a specific sector or industry. They are in construction, they are in service industries, they are in financial sector, they are contributing significantly to the economy of the country. I am looking forward with a further engagement, but as of now, the use of digital for SMEs is an essential tool and therefore they do have the necessary assistance from the government as well as the private sector in the form of the service providers and we have got two main service providers, Telecom Namibia that deals exclusively with the broadband fiber optics and then the mobile operator for the telecommunications. Uh, these are the main suppliers of the telecommunications to provide the digital services also to our SMEs. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I will stop here and uh, I'm looking forward for further engagement. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Okay, what, what I'd like to do now is, is open, up the, open this up to the panelists. Um, I think that was a very insightful uh, introduction there, and I think the key point that I've taken from that one there is digital is a must for SMEs. It's not a case of a choice, it's a must. Okay, I think we can see that given the fact that obviously that, you know, some of the SMEs of now will become the multinationals of the future, it's, imper it's imperative that we support their growth. So. Let's give this bit more of a growth context. Um, Mo, you've obviously been working at Coupon now for a while. You're a company, a very, uh, I suppose, a company that's moving very quickly within this digitalized world. We, we've heard some of the, the challenges and impediments. How do you see this? What do you see as the big kind of challenges that you face as a small business as you grow? Uh, that, I mean, basically, as a uh, as a startup that uh, started up in Scotland and and, and went uh, global, uh, the the notion here is um, when we are uh, about to to have the entire uh, company setup going and uh, uh, the entire manpower forces onboarded into the organisation, uh, there are certain challenges that we see. Um, and, and that's depend on the, on, on the region that we are targeting. So, for example, we have uh, the talent pool uh, that sometimes are not very much uh, up, to the, up to the speed of the uh, SME growth. We do have also some of the regulations um, and legislations in some uh, uh, regional uh, players or countries that uh, maybe sometimes slow down the growth of, of a startup, but uh, I mean, it's all understandable because they, the, the, the startup life basically is, is a fast-paced life. And that's where uh, we came down to uh, a comparison to other uh, uh, basically uh, entities, for example, government uh, or banking institution, that they do have a bit of legacy when it comes into running uh, internal processes, onboarding other startups. So mainly those are the main challenges that a startup in, uh, across the industries might face uh, these days. Okay, that, I think you, you touch on a key point that I think has been raised regularly over the last day and a half, and that is that talent is the new oil. Um, I think Absolutely. obviously talent is a challenge that most governments are wrestling with right now, is how can they educate the people for the workforce of the future? Um, 
focusing more on the startups, which is the, the car background around QPAL and so on, what have been the main catalysts for revolutionizing that startup economy over the past 20 years? Well, basically, if, if you look at the past 20 years, not, not even 20, but let's say past 40 years of, of the technology involvement, we see um, uh, that the, the tech startups have played a key role in uh, changing the entire economy. Uh, now, we're not talking about 80s because that's where, where the, uh, uh, the kickstart of the technology environment but in the 90s, that's where uh, giants that have been established in the 80s, for example, Microsoft and Oracle, started acquiring uh, other, other tech startups. And then moving forward to the 2000s and, and onward, um, we, we see some kind of um, interesting statistics, especially in, in the US, for example. In 2005, we had only two startup accelerators. In 2015, we reached the number of 200 in the US only. And that reflected on uh, the number of, of growing startups that, that we see. In 2007, we had only 25 to 28 unicorns. 2017, we have 289. And that number is growing very fast. So I would say that um, not only the technology tycoons, but the technology startups are working in, in uh, uh, congestion uh, to enable startups having uh, more automated processes internally, so affordable infrastructure, affordable business processes uh, or, or business management solutions like ERBs, affordable marketing tools that can reach 2,000 or 2,000 is a funny number here, but 2 millions and even a lot of, a lot of other um, uh, uh, consumers in a matter of no time. So I would say that, yeah, uh, the collaboration when it comes to the tech startups and the tycoons being fruitful and that's the way forward. No, I think, I think that makes perfect sense. And we're talking that, that that was very much driven by technology, but how has this benefited other sectors? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the idea here why we're focusing on, on technology from this conversation is that the, the technology is uh, of, you know, what we can say that it's the uh, pillar of the startups in different industries. Uh, we're not talking about um, a, a company who had uh, uh, created the one billion dollar uh, software, but that company is the one who's serving other startups in, in different industries in order to grow. Um, I'll give you an example, David. Um, we have this ERP solution, for example, NetSuite. Uh, the, the idea of, of this solution is to uh, help startups across industries in order to accelerate their internal processes. Uh, uh, agriculture, uh, financial institutions, and, and other, other, other sectors. Uh, and then that, the, the growth of that organization resulted indirectly and directly also in the growth of the uh, other startups in, in different other industries. So I think that's, that's basically the, the pillar of, of the uh, overall startup uh, development across the industries. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Come on, let's, let's, let's bring this back to more of an SME perspective. I mean, I think the startup side of it is fascinating. I think we could talk at length about this, but um, there's, there's, a, there's a parallel event going on called AIM Startup, and perhaps we should <laughs> take that further over there. But bringing this back from an SME perspective, um, come on, in your experience, what are the main challenges they face when growing beyond borders, and, and how is this digital revolution relevant? Uh, basically, this is, sorry, this one's more for Kamar, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, so let me talk about the four main challenges that SMEs face. And, you know, as you know, we work across 120 countries. Uh, the first is SME, the challenge is access to finance. I think that's number one challenge that's been there for ages. Second is the access to markets. And that's become more relevant as SMEs start to become global. So that's the second big challenge. Uh, then I think the access to knowledge, that's the third main challenge SMEs face. And the fourth, which is more, more in the last 20 years, is access to technologies. And, and that's where, you know, the cliched three, three ways of access 
to knowledge market um, and finance has been topped up with technology. So, so these are the four key challenges SMEs face growing globally. But let me put that in a context that the rise of the platforms has really enabled a lot of these challenges to be tackled. For example, rise of Ebays and Amazons and local platforms. And just to give you an idea, the e-commerce trade is $2.3 trillion in 2017, which is 10% of the global retail trade, which was 7% in 2015, and is projected to go to 15% of the global uh, trade e-commerce in 2021. So that space is really rising rapidly in terms of, uh, that's a space to watch. So just to conclude, I think I do feel the rise of platforms, the technologies are helping solve these four problems I've mentioned. And one more thing I'll, I'll, I'll refer to His Excellency's earlier comment is that it's also inclusive, inclusive growth, because what digital is doing is also giving opportunities for disadvantaged groups, for physically challenged people, for remote area, people operating in remote areas, for for women entrepreneurs. So I think this is also helping the disadvantaged groups. So all the more reason for SMEs now than anywhere in time in the history of last 300 years that they need a digital strategy. No, I, I think you touched on four key points. I mean, those four key pillars for those who didn't really take notice of those, I think were, they're obviously well known, as you quite rightly um, mentioned, is finance, market, knowledge, and demand. I mean, I, th I think that makes perfect sense. But this, this digital platforms, how, how can they leverage these? You know, what's your kind of sense in, in terms of how they can best leverage those, those, those platforms? See, I think there are five, six different kind of platforms. You know, there are P2P platforms, there are crowdfunding platforms, there are invoice platforms. I mean, there are different types of platforms that SMEs can use. I think the first, I think there are three main things SMEs need to look at. I think one is adoption of technologies. And when, when we say technology, it's not just about a cloud-based technology. It's also about, uh, it's also about just social media, uh, data analytics, uh, cloud technologies. So th recently there was a survey carried out in EU where they ranked the technology adoptions by nine categories. And the top three where adoption is the most is these three in terms of social media, data analytics, and cloud technologies. Of course, mobile services, you know, Internet of Things, AI is, is down the ladder, you know. So I think they need to, uh, SMEs need to leverage these platforms, not for only doing business, but also accessing finance and capital. Uh, so I think that's one space that SMEs need to focus on. Uh, then I think the overall uh, adoption, what we've seen in SMEs is, you'll be surprised to know, there was a survey recently carried out globally that Technology adoption is 75% in SMEs which are less than 10 employees and 40 to 50% with companies more than 250 employees. So technology adoption, we need to understand, is happening quite rapidly in the very small enterprise space. And where are they using the technology? There are four or five main areas that they're using technologies. One is on production management, process management. Uh, the other is KYC, customer management, customer engagement. I think that's where a lot of technologies are coming in. Then digital advertising, marketing. This is another area where I'm talking about the top five. You know, there are many others. Then there are enhancement of sales and new channels. So an SME sitting in Nigeria can sell to a client sitting in India uh, today based on, you know, the digital platforms that are available. So I think that's also... Uh, so enhancement of sales. And lastly, what SMEs are using technologies are to become more competitive. So these are the five main areas yeah. uh, technology adoption is happening in the SMEs. Okay. And we, we kind of touched upon earlier when the Honourable Minister was speaking there in terms of some of the role that the public sector, particularly in Namibia, has taken. Now, I'm sure we'll hear from Raymond in the, in the next you know, 15, 20 minutes or so. We'll hear a bit more about the role that Hong Kong has, has placed on helping in the SMEs digitalize and so on or meet this digital challenge. Kamal, I mean, what do you think from, from your experience, the public and private sector can, what, what role can they play to foster this inclusion? 
sorry, this is back aimed again at, at, at Kamar. Just looking at your experience, how, how do you see that dynamic? Question for me? Or? This is back to you, Kamar. Sorry, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. So I'll come back to you in a second, Raymond. Sorry. Okay. So I think we are increasingly seeing governments play uh, very, like ICT, public. If I see the private sector flow into the uh, fintech and, you know, the investment uh, of, you know, in technologies, I think the private sector has come a long way. But the public sector is playing a very key role. Let me give an example of EU. The 19 countries in EU that have a digitized industrialization strategy. So, uh, so Germany, Austria, the Denmark, they have, Germany has Industry 4.0. Uh, there are 19 countries that have actually launched a specific programs. I think that's, that's one way that you can really help digitize. It's not just about finance, it's about their manufacturing, it's about their services. So, so that's one example of how governments can influence. Then I think you also need to regulate and you know, enable uh, the, the fintechs. I think fintech lending globally uh, is $300 billion industry right now in terms of, and if you look at where the lending uh, it's coming from, it's mainly coming in China and the US and, and the UK because the enabling environments are better. Uh, so, so I think that you also need to help from a regulatory standpoint. For example, the PST2 and GDPR, you know, the UK uh, has uh, created these uh, regulatory regimes. So that's also, I think, uh, a key enabler that, you know, governments need to partner. And of course, providing an ecosystem uh, for, for commerce. Uh, so the rise of supply chains in terms of how you can digitize supply chains. I think that's e-invoicing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an, another role a government can play, and we've seen in Turkey, we've seen in Colombia, we've seen in many China, we've seen in many countries where you know e-invoicing mm -hmm. has become, so once you have an electronic invoice, it gr gives greater transparency to all the stakeholders involved. So, so I think there are clear examples around the world on how you can, uh, how governments actually are stepping in from providing infrastructure, from providing financial infrastructure, as well as providing ecosystem for growth. Good, okay, thank you. Um, Raymond, let me bring you in on this topic. So I think obviously this is, you know, Hong Kong has been uh, uh, to a certain extent best practice in terms of some of its act, um, instruments is put in place to encourage SME development. Can you just shine some light in terms of some of the activities that are being put in place there to support this, this growth? Okay, uh, thank you, David. Assalamu uh, alaikum. I'm Raymond Yip the, from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. My name spells YIP. Some people think that I'm VIP, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our organization has been in this market since the early 70s, only a few years after this, this country became independent. Um, I would like to follow up on the point made by Kama about access to markets. I think it's very important, particularly for small economies, including this country, how to scale up a, a, a small and medium enterprise and also startups. The fact that Hong Kong is, we are, we are, we are only a small territory, with only 7.4 million people. So from day one, our companies have been looking beyond our borders to scale up because we don't have a domestic market big enough for us. So if you look at our SMEs, we have roughly 340,000 SME uh, companies in Hong Kong. 98% of them are SMEs, employed less than 20 people. But you'll be very surprised, one third of these companies, over 100,000 of them, actually are engaged in international trade import-export business. It's a very high percentage by world standards. It shows that every one of us, a lot of us, are actually eyeing the international market, including, lately, our motherland, mainland China. We are now part of China. Uh, we are we, we united with China since 1997. So we are part of China, but we practice a different system. We remain a capitalist uh, economy with our own laws based on English common law, with our own currency, with our own systems, with our own immigration control, with our own customs. So Hong Kong continue to be a free port. So the, T the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, which I represent, has all, the, all along since the, the past 50 years been helping companies, of 
of many of our SMEs to get to gain access into international markets. We come to this market, we exhibit in trade fairs, we bring delegations overseas, and we also help to connect, I think building connectivity, as Karma mentioned, access to connection is also very important. Capital is very important also for companies to scale up. The, freeze, the fact that Hong Kong is the world's third largest financial market after London and New York does give SMEs and startups a lot of opportunity to access capital. We have the largest venture capital pool in Asia. So roughly 20% of Asia's venture capital is in Hong Kong after mainland China. And our stock market was the number one market for IPO in the world last year. For the past 10 years, we have six years that we are the largest IPO center. So for companies, startups, SMEs to scale up, to get to access the capital, to exit, we have all the solutions. And uh, about access to knowledge, I think apart from tech, we also need to have access to new business models. So business models is the winning game. Technology is only a facilitator. At the end of the day, the business model wins. So how we could we equip our SMEs to access new business models? For example, lately we have been helping, or for the past few years, helping our companies to get on e-commerce, either in trading with e-commerce platforms or using e-commerce platform to promote business across borders. So this is something that we've been doing, and uh, I think we will continue to do this. And the government is a very conducive policy for SMEs. Last year, our, our government even reduced the tax, which is already very low in Hong Kong, is 16.5%. The government reduced it to 8.25% for SMEs generating income less than 2 million Hong Kong dollars. So policy is very important. But at the end of the day, the government can only facilitate. The government cannot do business and should not do business themselves. So we will continue to maintain that role and we will we'll provide a free, open, transparent, level playing field for all sorts of businesses, including those from overseas. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. I think the, the, the SMEs are in safe hands, right? Okay, we've got Namibia, they, we, 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 we're enabling you know, the infrastructure for SMEs to digitalize and to grow. And, and in Hong Kong, we're hearing about the business models and so on, how they're supporting the growth there. Um, Abdul, if I can turn to you very quickly, I mean, obviously, from your perspective, you know, you've been a, a regular investor in, in companies over the past, you know, 10, 15 years and so on. Let's look at the UAE for a second. You know, is, is this ambition, I mean, a third of, of SMEs in Hong Kong are doing international trade. Are we seeing a similar type of picture in the UAE? Or if not, why not? So, I mean, the answer to this question depends on whether you're talking about SMEs that are uh, digitally enabled or bricks and mortar SMEs. Sure. Uh, obviously, we're seeing a lot more of that in, you know, what, what I would describe as tech, tech startups mm -hmm. uh, and early stage tech companies. But you're seeing it in bricks and mortar as well. Um, as a lawyer, which is my day job, uh, you know, I'm advising uh, startups and companies that are in the more kind of M part of SMEs uh, that are homegrown, founded in this region, and currently trading with uh, Southeast Asia, with United States, with Europe, and exporting products that are built, designed, developed, conceived right here in the region. And that ranges not just from technology companies, but to bricks and mortar businesses as well. So, I mean, one of my clients right now is one of the biggest technology companies out of the Middle East, but they're actually selling software on a SaaS basis into some of the biggest listed companies in the United States, exporting uh, you know, uh, concepts and, and products that were developed here. Even in the F&B sector, we have um, concepts that are developed right here in Dubai, uh, very popular brands and concepts. Uh, I'm working with a client right now on, on opening uh, a very large number of outlets for their brand, Dubai-based brand, in London, New York, and four cities in Latin America. 
So yes, the answer is there, there is quite a lot of it happening actually. Um, not as much as I think uh, Raymond was talking about in Hong Kong. Um, and, and, but I suspect there is, there is more to come. Great, okay. And I mean, I'm gonna turn this back to finance for a second, access to finance. I know Kamar, obviously in your role, you're actively involved in SME finance and so on. Um, I guess it'd be useful just if you could share some examples of the importance of SME finance, the importance of making that finance available to, 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 to foster that growth. I mean, we heard, I think, um, there was an example on the first day where the Islamic Development Bank have set aside $500 million for SMEs and so on. Can you give us a bit more from your experience? See, I think, let me put this into a bit of perspective, you know, what is the SME finance problem we're dealing with? It's the size of $12 trillion, almost the size of China's economy. So you can see the size of SME finance, and, and that's one space I feel banks, uh, financial system ignores the space, you know, in most of the countries. Like, Raymond, you're talking about Hong Kong, you know, it's a more settled market, but you go to Africa, you go to some of the, I mean, the remote people, areas, they don't have access to even internet. Uh, you, you look at, at the World Bank, we do this global logistics and global and financial and uh, internet inclusion index. And we see in Africa, many of the countries don't even have internet in the remote location. So that's why Africa is really, uh, uh, I think, moved quite uh, fast in terms of mobile services. And there are 300 million uh, mobile money transactions taking place in Africa. So I think that's where they've kind of taken the lead. But let me st step back and say, what is the problem we're dealing with? There are global uh, supply is around three and a half trillion dollars of SME finance, and the rest is not available. There is three trillion dollars needed in the informal sector, and there is five trillion dollar needed in the formal sector. So you're dealing with nearly eight, eight and a half trillion unmet finance demand. So what are banks doing? Uh, at the, uh, there are banks, there are uh, non-bank financial institutions, but the new kid in the game is really the fintech. The fintech lending has now started to come into play. And let me give you an example of UK. When the financial crisis happened, there were four banks dominating 80% of the SME finance. So all UK government did was that they said, uh, the regulator stepped in, that you refer these to the fintech alternate <coughs> lenders. So the alternate lending in UK market jumped from less than 1% to 3% in a matter of two years. So I think, uh, the fintechs uh, are coming to the play, but now the flip side. Fintech lending globally, the lending that they do globally, is not more than $300 billion. Collective SME lending, uh, all lending. Of which SME lending is not more than 10%. So not more than $30 billion is going from the fintechs into SME finance. So again, let me equate that to $12 trillion problem. So if you're dealing with that kind of a problem, I, I believe there is a, there's a four-corner model needed to solve this problem. I think one definitely is financial institutions have to come to play. The banks have to come to the party. And, and I think I, I see some banks are more involved, some are less involved, but I think banks have come to the party. I think that's one. Then regulators, they need to step in and create collateral regimes, create you know, financial infrastructure, have ecosystem, they have to uh, come in. Then, of course, the real sector, uh, the real, uh, the, the, the corporations, they have a responsibility to, to en enhance their value chains because they don't really go beyond tier one. So how do corporations play a role in solving this problem? And lastly, uh, the fintechs, I think, again, have a responsibility to squarely look at the, the SME lending space, it's not enough to do payments, it's not enough to do consumer lending, because a lot of fintechs are really targeting bank products, mortgage products, retail products, you know, but SME lending is not something they have really squarely looked at. And I feel, I mean, I'll conclude by saying one of the biggest trends I'm seeing right now is optimizing SME finance through supply chains. I think that's really a big win in the game, and the, the institutions that embrace uh, supply chain finance, I think, will will have an easier growth path than the rest. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kamal. 
Abdullah, this brings you back to you then. So, you know, from your experience as, a, as, a, as an investor in companies, what do you think are the key ingredients for SMEs should put in place to secure this financing? I mean, obviously, there, there's a challenge here, right? What, how do you think they should prepare themselves? What do they need to do? Well, look, I mean, obviously, there is a challenge. Uh, and, and certainly, I can say from experience as an investor here in this region, SMEs struggle to raise debt, uh, you know, debt for, uh, for, the, for their business models. Um, and, and, and certainly in the digital sector or companies that are, you know, powered by, by technology, um, frequently the, the scaling of a company to a point where it breaks even can actually take quite a long period of time. So as an SME, you do not look attractive to banks or lenders. Um, so, I mean, you know, one of the points uh, Kamar just touched on is, you know, government support. Certainly, uh, we've seen examples of uh, government support for uh, equity capital or soft loan capital uh, being made available for, uh, for SMEs, and that can be a really strong catalyst to help SMEs with their capital requirements. But at the end of the day, you know, and, and you can take your example from Silicon Valley and the startup uh, history of, of that particular part of the world, equity is really where it's going to be coming from for most SMEs. So if you, if you start from the point that, uh, you know, a business model that still takes time to build out and scale and become profitable, and it's going to take time, then what you need to do as an SME is make yourself investor ready as, earlier as, as early as possible. And what does that mean? So being investor ready means when you go and sit with a potential equity investor, somebody who's going to take equity risk in your company, they need to see a business model that is uh, you know, likely to succeed, a team that is going to execute because team is fundamentally the most important thing for an investor looking to put equity into an SME. Um, and track record of execution is very important for that. And that means talent. So there's another element to do with talent, which I'll come on to. But just the fundamentals are, you know, you have to have a clean structure, you have to have a proper corporate structure, something that an investor will be confident that he can buy into, uh, any intellectual property and intellectual capital that is part of that business model needs to be properly documented and, and protected, and it needs to belong to the company. Investors really care about that stuff. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to your business model, and, you know, Raymond touched on this point earlier, you know, the digital tools that are out there are not just enablers of SMEs from an operational perspective, but they should be fundamental parts of the SME business model too. And of course, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of this. Some people say talent is the new oil. Some people say data is the new oil. And we're seeing lots of uh, SMEs in the region who are succeeding because they're able to... Um, you know, bring uh, these digital platforms and technologies into the actual business model. So uh, back, back to the point about what you need to do as an SME, I think you need to be, you know, a clean structure, you need to be attractive for investors, they need to see capital efficiency as an absolutely integral part of your business model as well, so that when it comes time to scale, you're going to be able to scale in a way which is sustainable for the company and isn't just drawing on, on uh, equity investment and spending it, but rather seeing a route towards breaking even, uh, uh, being you know, defined. Um, so all of those things, I think, are really important. Coming back to the point that I was making about talent, uh, and this is something which in, in our region, we're a little bit, uh, uh, we're starting to, to do it now, but we've been a little bit slow in adopting it, and it's the employee share option um, scheme that is very common in, in Western uh, early stage companies. But here, you know, I, I speak to founders of companies a lot who say, ah, you know, I can get cheap labor and, uh, you know, they'll be grateful to receive a check of $500 a month or whatever it is. But actually, if you really want to compete, you need to get very talented people who can execute back to the point about execution. And so you need to be able to make part of your capital available to actually remunerate people, not just with a salary check, but also with a stake in the company. Because everybody has skin in the game, everybody is on an aligned journey, uh, and, and hopefully that is a driver of success for SMEs. So I'm a strong, as an investor, 
even though it is counterintuitive, technically as an investor, it's not in my interest to say, put 20% of your shares aside to issue to your employees. Actually, as an investor, it really is in my interest because I want all of those employees to be incentivized and to be part of the same journey of success. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Abdullah. <clears throat> I'm conscious we haven't got much time left, and I want to make sure that we have a chance to open this expert panel up to the audience. So if there are any questions, please feel free to, to ask them, and we'll, we'll try and tackle them as best we can. But please, you know, when you ask your question, please state who you are, where you're from, and please keep it succinct. So we've got a question at the front. If we can have a microphone, please. Okay. putting together what's the progress, how much of depth is there in terms of angel investing in the <coughs> UAE, in Dubai? Sure, thank you uh, for your question. Well, uh, we, we started it two and a half years ago as a network of, a small network of angel investors. Um, within a year of starting it, we um, actually became a fully capitalized investment company uh, operating on a micro VC thesis. So we actually invest as a venture capital firm uh, on a micro VC basis. So we invest around a quarter of a million dollars of our balance sheet in every investment we do, but we have uh, 80 individuals and one very large UAE-based institution uh, on the balance sheet. So each of them uh, will top up investments, which means that we do seed and series A stage funding rounds up to three, four million dollars, uh, and anything as low as, you know, four, five hundred thousand uh, dollars. We've done 21 investments in the 24 months that we've been going, so nearly one a month. Um, and uh, we've got five, six investments in Silicon Valley, one in the UK, one in Finland, one in Turkey, four in the UAE, and two in Egypt. Fantastic. Is there any other questions from the floor? Yes, we've got one over there as well, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Thierry. I'm from Comesa, uh, the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa. My question is uh, directed to Honorable Minister from uh, Namibia. Um, I, I know that you have a very dynamic youth involved in innovation. And one of the ways uh, to empower the SMEs, the startups, uh, is uh, to put them together, to link them to the multinational, the large corporates. Because these are the people who are driving the new technology. I don't know if you have a, a policy in Namibia which address the issue related to local content. Because this can allow uh, the company, the, the small and medium enterprise, to benefit from the large uh, companies if you have the right uh, policy in place. The second question is uh, the development of the capabilities for SMEs and the startups. Uh, in Swaziland, for example, they have managed to put in place uh, a, a techno industrial parks which will operate like an incubator for SMEs and the startup to give them the uh, capabilities to access to the digitalized world. I don't know if uh, in Namibia you have uh, those policies, but also those platforms, uh, uh, infrastructure facilities to really support the SMEs. I meant Isitwani. Isitwani is uh, the new name of Swaziland. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Yes, in Namibia, we do have policy, and uh, I must uh, admit that in Namibian context, the youth are the majority in terms of the population, statistic-wise, and therefore the high unemployment is a concern, hence the commitment to help the SMEs. And I deliberately 
gave you or shared with you the statistics so that you can appreciate when we talk of small and medium. Uh, in other developed countries, a small enterprise might be a medium or even a big company in uh, my country. We have those uh, experiences. Uh, in terms of the policy, yes, we do have a policy, and that policy starts right from top because of the policy of including the young people who understand and should understand their needs. It starts, that's in terms of that policy, to include youth, even in the decision-making, that we do have at the highest level an advisor to the president directly who is youth on youth matters and youth employment or enterprises. That's one. Two, as a result of that policy, we have got 121 constituencies or districts. And as a matter of policy, the president directed that there must be enterprises called youth enterprises in each district so that the youth are physically and tangibly involved in their own development through the SME development. And on top of that, we have a national youth council also managed by the youth with a full-time executive chair and this includes the different youth groups or organizations from different political parties together to help them grow the enterprises. Um, but also, as a matter of policy within the uh, government structures, whether it is now member of parliament, cabinet, they are part and parcel of this uh, so that we don't talk about the youth but that they themselves are active participants in the development of uh, their future. But also we recognize that the future is no more analog but digital technology. They understand we believe the future better this is why we cannot decide for them by saying the youth of today is the leaders of tomorrow, therefore they must wait. So we involve them or include them that they are part of so that you have got the older, the wisdom, as well as the youth for them to gain the experience as part of the policy. Now in terms of the capacity, the capacity cannot be addressed through the policy only. They must be part of the process that they can learn, make mistakes, correct them together. That is what we do in Namibia. It is still, um, let me put it this way, as they say, the road to success is like a construction. So you have all these teething problems and challenges in the way, but at least we are all doing together. We understand them better when we work with them. They understand us as the older generation better when we work together and we therefore uh, eliminate the gap between the older and the young. But we move together and build it together that you have the new and the old to shape a better Namibia but also a better uh, region. So on the part of SADC, at the last SADC summit. So if we can be brief, we have to wrap up. Oh, Sorry. Thank you very much. The last SADC summit, we concentrated or dedicated it to the youth involvement in terms of enter, uh, industrialization through youth development and women empowerment. That's as SADC region, we commit ourselves to the youth as well as women empowerment. And we are in the process of unpacking that particular theme, I submit. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, 
I think this has been a fascinating debate and one that could go on for another few hours. I think we've barely scratched the surface. We could talk about talent, we could talk about access to finance, we can talk about access to markets, we could talk about so many more things. Um, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to ask all the questions that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, I'm sorry if we haven't answered your, your questions from the floor, but I want to extend my sincere appreciation to you all for your contribution. I'm sure you are joining me in thanking this panel for their, their contributions.